This little cinema camera packs quite a punch, but also requires a lot of the user. So let's start out with what I like about this camera. Most obviously would have to be the image quality. The Sony S-Log footage in 4K is wonderfully flat and easy to grade. I will say that at the time of this recording, Adobe Premiere imports Sony S-Log footage with a really bad color grade. The first time you import your footage, you may wet your pants thinking that you did something horribly wrong on set, but don't worry, just right click the footage first, go to modify interpret footage and in the color management section, select rec 709 in the color space override and you'll be good to go. This is a really annoying and unnecessary step and one that they will hopefully resolve soon. Well, that was a bad pun. Now back to what I love about this camera. When I shot in high contrast situations with the sun or light from windows, I was generally able to recover a lot of the highlights in post. Speaking of which, one of the biggest pluses to this camera is the internal variable ND system. This was the very first Super 35mm camcorder to be equipped with internal variable ND, and it is so nice. You'll never completely ruin a second or two of your footage mid-shot when changing ND. Simply scrolling this wheel here at the front of the camera gradually adjusts the ND seamlessly as you record. I will say that the response time to this seemed to be a little slow, but hey, I'll take that over filter holders rotating across the sensor. What else do I love about this camera? Well, it is able to write this 4K 8-bit color footage onto SD cards rather than CFast, so I don't need a CFast card reader to import my footage onto my computer. This is just a convenience, but certainly comes in handy on most workflows, especially when working with other editors or sharing footage. That's because this camera writes 4K at 100 megabytes per second, which means that one hour of footage will only fill about a 45 gigabytes of hard drive space. Now bear in mind that you can only shoot 24, 25, or 30 frames per second at the 4K. If you want higher frame rates or slow motion, you have to drop down to HD. But this brings me to another plus about this camera. If you are going to be mostly shooting and working in an HD format, this camera may be the one for you because its HD resolutions come in 10-bit color, which is incredible and can support higher frame rates for slow motion. Two really nice options that unfortunately the 4K does not allow, but will make for great HD, which is Okay, because HD is still an industry standard workflow today. Now, if you know me, then you know I like convenience in cameras, quick setup, fast settings changes, and lots of accessorizing options. And here are the positives as it relates to these in this camera. First off, the camera has one XLR input into the back of the camera body itself. It's on the back side here. Would I like two of these on the camera body? Of course, but hey, one is better than none. <coughs> Canon. The second XLR input is on the detachable top handle of the camera. To be using two channels of XLR, I will probably have the camera on a tripod or doing run and gun handheld, both of which attaching this top handle will be no problem. Gimbaling may be the only situation in which I wouldn't have the top handle on the camera, in which case one channel of XLR is probably all I'll need. I guess a shoulder rig system wouldn't need the top handle either, so this may be the one setup where two XLR inputs is inconvenient with this camera. Now, speaking of the top handle, this is a decent model. It's nice and sturdy and accessorizable. It does have two screw-on points, here, which doubles the setup and teardown time, but also makes it far more secure when attached to the camera. The camera body itself has most of the screw ports for accessorizing along the top here, and that's nice because you aren't dependent on the top handle if you don't want it. Finally, Sony tends to retain its value better than other camera companies. You can check out my video here on that, but if you are wanting to invest in a camera that won't depreciate as much as, say, Panasonic or Blackmagic, then Sony is the way to go. Well, that's what I like about this camera, but what about it don't I like? Well, let me tell you, these are significant for me. First off, the intuition or ease of changing some of the important settings is about as far off as can be. Sony's menu systems are notorious for being complex and confusing, and I can add to that testimony. After scouring the menus and the user guided manual for this camera, 
I still have not figured out how to get full manual control over my exposure. It looks like my ND, aperture, shutter speed, and ISO are all locked in, but when I point the camera at brightly lit views, swing to dark spots, it's adjusting the exposure automatically, and I can't figure out how to override this hard as I try. Now I know it's in there somewhere, it's definitely possible with this camera, but honestly, Sony, this kind of stuff is important to make intuitive and simple. So big fail here, even though it is possible to get fully manual exposure. Same with the white balance adjustment. I don't know about you, but I film a great deal both outside and inside, and I constantly need to change my white balance. After 15 or 20 minutes of failing to figure this out again, consulting manuals and YouTube, my good friend who has used this camera a decent bit was able to walk me through the process over text while I was on set. The white balance buttons on the body itself do not work when you are shooting Sony S-Log. No, you have to go into the menus, find the picture profile you are using, and change the white balance there. Oh, and you better know your Kelvin temps because that's the only reference you're gonna get. I'm sorry, but again, why would Sony make it so darn difficult to change this important setting only when using the best image profile the camera has? It makes no sense to me. I also had the same issue when changing the frame rates. There was no intuitive way that I found for this. I think it was my friend again who had to walk me through it after I was going apoplectic on my own. It's another confusing menu adjustment that isn't organized where I would think that it should be. All that to say, basic and important settings adjustments are a pain in the butt to change and not where one would first look to make these changes. Honestly, this made my experience with this camera very frustrating overall. This is a significant issue because the pressures of being on set and clients waiting on you to hit record can make complex systems all the more difficult to navigate. You never want to appear completely inept in front of your client, but you also don't want to fake it and utterly ruin your footage because you were filming in the wrong white balance or frame rate. With enough practice, you can of course learn where all the menus and settings and buttons are and how to change anything that you want to change, but I believe intuitive design is of great value in cinema cameras and this camera fails here. Like most cameras that are more than a couple of years old, the autofocus in my experience sucked. It was crazy slow and rather unreliable to the extent that I ditched it quickly for manual focus with a focus wheel. Focus is the first thing that will make or break your shot, and ultimately autofocus systems have not become super reliable until the last year or two. So though this camera does have autofocus, I wouldn't depend on it. The next thing I didn't like about the camera was the build quality and design, but honestly, this is a mixed bag for me and ultimately a personal preference issue depending on the style of shooting you tend to use most. This elongated design works well for shoulder mounts, but it's problematic for gimbals. I can't actually get it on my Moza Air 2 with the lenses that I have. Maybe there's a perfectly sized and weighted lens out there that can be used to mount this camera to that style of gimbal, but it's not in my stash. Of course, a different kind of gimbal system like a ring gimbal will work no problem, but that's additional cost that you have to invest in. This camera is surprisingly small and very light, which is always both a pro and a con. It's a lot easier to transport and less taxing on the arms for handheld shoulder rig or gimbaled styles of shooting, but always risks worse jitters and bumps in the footage that may be unrecoverable in post. This is ultimately up to personal preference and shooting style, and you'll just have to try it for yourself to see how it works for you. I was shooting with an Atomos external recorder attached to the camera so it had good size and weight to it to smooth out my handheld shots. Most of these were easily corrected with warp stabilizer and post, and it performed fairly well in this workflow. One little quirk that I don't like about this camera, but is honestly a nitpick, is it doesn't shoot true 4K. It actually shoots UHD, Ultra HD. True 4K is 4096 by 2160, which is a 1.9 to 1 aspect ratio. This camera shoots 3840 by 2160, which is a 1.78 to 1 or 16 by 9 aspect ratio. So in essence, it's not quite as wide as true 4K. Your clients will never know the difference, and you'll probably never know the difference unless you're combining it with other 4K footage or used to a 4K workflow. Another minor issue that I have with this camera is it's not Netflix approved. This really only hurts you if you're doing documentary filmmaking or independent narrative work. Sure, you can get your projects distributed on other platforms with this camera, but Netflix approved camera list pretty much guarantees universal distribution online, 
and it's a shame not to have those options at your disposal just in case. So all in all, I will say that like most Sony cameras, you honestly get more features and value for the price you pay. Sony tends to sneak some really quality specs in their cameras at the price point that competition does not offer. And this may be why their cameras tend to depreciate at a slower rate than most. That said, you sacrifice that for mind-splitting complexity and frustrations with usability at least when starting out. If you can get over that hump, you'll probably stay with Sony for life. So who is this camera for and who is it not for? For those who want to enter the Sony system universe, this camera makes for a great entry level option. You can pick one up rather affordably with my eBay affiliate link in the description below and begin cutting your teeth on all of those complex Sony menus and form factor designs. You'll get a great image at an affordable bit rate and then upgrade to higher level Sony cinema cameras when you can justify the cost. This would be a great wedding videography camera. You get an excellent image profile with decently small file sizes. You can easily format the camera for shoulder rigs, tripods, handheld, and some gimbals and still have options for audio in, slow motion, and HD only of course. You won't be using unconscionable amounts of hard drive space and could capture some excellent quality footage with three or four of these bad boys. This camera is likewise good for event videography. I personally recommend the Canon C100 Mark II for events because it requires less post-production grading, writes at much smaller bit rates, saving you hard drive space for long event sessions, and has all you really need for this workflow. However, if you prefer the Sony system and plan on other kinds of projects as well, this may be the better choice. This camera is good for commercial videographers as well who are willing to put in the extra time it will take to learn the menus and the ways this camera is set up. Again, Sony's retain their value well and have virtually owned the documentary, television narrative, and broadcast spaces for a reason. If you want the Sony system in the long run, this is a great entry level option that gives you more value and bang for your buck than the competition tends to offer. Personally, I would not recommend this camera for documentary filmmakers or narrative filmmakers distributing online. Not being Netflix approved gives you a shorter shelf life and less distribution options for these projects. And you can get an approved camera for not much more even within the Sony system. I also wouldn't recommend it for entry level videographers. The menus and processes to change basic settings are too complex and discouraging for newbies. Go for Blackmagic or Canon to start out with. Well, that's all for this one. As usual, I won't be seeing you in the next video, but you'll see me rough.